Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand the experiences of the LGBTQ community. And you are in for a treat. This is going to be a three-part series, so buckle up. That means three hours. You're going to be here with us for at least three hours, which is kind of exciting because i um, we have a really, really interesting lineup in the next three episodes. Uh, if you saw the teasers, we are uh, interviewing the Packer family, uh, Kay and Chris. Super interesting backgrounds, super um, relatable and unrelatable stories. And you'll find that as these uh, unpackage as we discuss that as part of this Latter Gay Stories uh, three-peat episode, we'll call it. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I'm just giving you a heads up up front. You are committed for the next three hours um, or for the next three episodes, this one and two others after. We're first um, going to be in interviewing um, Kay Packer and discussing her individual story, uh, then her husband's story, and then the couple interview. So this uh, really will be exciting. So again, buckle up and thank you for um, for joining us. For those of you who want to um, participate in, if you are watching on the video version and want to participate in this discussion, we invite you to comment and follow along in the live chat. If you are on YouTube, the live chat is to the right and uh, you can follow along there. Leave your comments, suggestions, um, feelings as you go through this episode and we'll respond that way. Also, if you are listening um, on an audio version through one of our audio podcast players, iHeartMedia, uh, Apple, Google, or one of the other many podcast players where we are found, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. Those who listen and catch the audio versions subscribing to our channel that way will always get the episodes just a little bit earlier. So that's a great way to catch up and to participate in the audio episodes. This episode and others are available online at LatterGayStories.org, where you can click on the episode tab. So with that out of the way, I want to welcome to the podcast, uh, uh, Kay Packer. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your story. And oh, it's a lot of vulnerability. Uh, taking the hot seat. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I do want to say... Um, we met at Thrive, at a yes. Thrive event. Yes, and, I love that. Um, completely unaware of your story. And as we sat and mixed and mingled, um, the philosophies of men mingled with a bit of scripture, <laughs> we got to this point. We are here. So thank you yeah. for giving an hour of your time and um, bringing your spouse along and making this a family affair. Yes. To be able to share your story and your experience with the um, latter gay stories community. Let's let the audience get to know you a little bit better. It's very familiar, uh, story, especially as it relates to Mormonism. Yeah. Quiet, closeted lesbian girl who wanted to do everything right. Correct. That who wanted, me. that's you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you and so many people, uh, like you, we're going to just talk about what life looks like as you unpackage and unfold that, um, the difficulties that you face um, navigating this world without a manual, without a lot of family, society, or religious, um, I don't even want to say pressure, but religious help or right. assistance. There are no manuals that teach you how to be a happy, successful, and thriving lesbian. No, I wish there was. <laughs> and Mormon at the same time, or even any, any type of organized religion. Yeah. Um, but then also the story of dating and trying to navigate the world of love. And the interesting part about Mormonism, I think, is that so much of this world uh, is taught about gender roles and, and your relationship to uh, deity and how you should act and respond as a woman. But when we're on this side of the aisle, there are no manuals, there are no teachings, there are no definitions on how to gay date, how mm -hmm. to form relationships, uh, how to manage or merge the feelings that are inside of us that are intrinsic and raw and real. And so I kind of want to use this episode to discuss those. And, and for those who are closeted, listening 
trying to better understand their own experience, maybe lean into your story a little bit and help them to know that it's okay to come out. Yeah. That there is happiness on the other side of the aisle. The spiritual experiences do exist, um, that people do thrive, um, not only post Mormon, but people thrive post coming out or post letting in, mm -hmm. allowing people to get to know them better. So that's part of the case story that I want to get to. Um, it's a lot. I know it is a lot. There's no pressure at all either. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's let the audience get to know you a little better. Tell us a, a little bit about, about yourself, who you are and what you do. Well, let me let you in. <laughs> oh, I like it. <laughs> um, well, do you want me to start at the beginning or do you want me to just jump in from like when I knew I was gay? Let's first start with who is Kay today? Who am I today? Mom. Yes. Edu uh, what, uh, I education. I am a mom. I am a wife. I am happy. I feel like I am healthy and I am um I just live every day as a learner. Like I just want to be living in a place where I'm evolving and growing and making space to um, always know myself better. Um, so I guess I don't know who I am. I haven't ever stopped learning who I am because I don't like to pigeonhole myself into something, but I am, I tell myself every single day I am love. That's who I, I try and tell myself that I am love, I create love, I give love, I receive love, and that's, that's me. I like it. <laughs> so that's a great way of introducing it and welcoming Kay to the podcast. Yes. Now I suppose we can get to the point where we say, Kay, <laughs> at what point did you realize? You were gay. Can I'm we rhyme it? Um, I knew from a really young age, and I definitely didn't have the verbiage for it, but I um have always tried to just tried to live my life in a way that um i wasn't ever hiding anything if that makes sense so um, my first friendship was a girl across the street from me and we were three when we met and we kind of just typical um little kid role play we started experimenting and i knew really early on probably around like four or five of the our role plays that this meant something more to me than it was meaning anything to her and that I really was enjoying you know um, our friendship a lot <laughs> even from a really young age anyway um, never said anything and at some point you know we both got baptized and we stopped and that was like put on a shelf and we never revisited any of that, but it was more of like, um, I was aware of my feelings at that point, you know, from a really early age, not knowing that it meant anything like, oh, there's chemistry here, or this means I like girls or whatnot, but I just knew um, I had liked our relationship. Even, I know I say five, we're really young, um, but that always meant something to me and moving forward, it just made me aware. So, and, and I think that's familiar territory. A lot of us will listen to that and say, yeah, we're never taught, especially within Mormonism, what this other side of the aisle or the opportunities on the other side of the aisle, uh, right. look like, or even options that are warranted mm -hmm. because uh, there, there was this mentality in Mormonism that if we talked about lesbianism or homosexuality, you could become it. Right. So it, it was one of those topics that become super taboo. So it makes, it makes a lot of sense that there was no language for it. A lot of sense that there were often isn't any discussion. Maybe that's my question is growing up in, in your home, was there discussion about, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, for better or for worse? Do you remember a lot of that discussion at all or any? When I was young, not really. But as um, my family evolved and we became, you know, more, I'm at the end of five kids. So um, I have three older siblings and one younger. And as we started getting more mature, um, that's when that language actually started being used in a very negative way. Um, my family was really uh, disrespectful in the way that they would talk about 
you know, homophobes and they would just use language that would really bother me. Of course, for any person that has a heart, it was like frustrating to hear racism or um, people who were my, my own family members saying things that were so hurtful to what I felt like. You don't even know what you're talking about. And here I am as I got older, right? And I started having that awareness. I'm like, you don't even know who I am. And yet this is, I feel like I'm not safe to ever say or speak my truth here because I know that my family will never ever understand me or, um, yeah. So I lived a lot in fear of knowing how I really felt from a really young age and not knowing what to do with that really, but wanting to um, be true to myself and um, being honest about my feelings was always a really important thing. So just finding the right people to be, you know, have those safe conversations with, um, which were not very many places to turn to. So growing up in the church, it felt like you just stifled all of that. You just shoved it down because um, you just wanted to be seen as normal and fit the mold and be, you know, I mean, what was really important for me was to be seen as like good and righteous. Um, but the conversations in my household, like getting back to what you're talking about, never really took place. It was just always assumed that like, I will meet a guy and I will be in a healthy Mormon relationship. And the goal was always a temple marriage. And um, my siblings were, I would, I mean, is this a term anymore? But like Jack Mormons in the way that like they were one way on Sunday and completely other way on the week, during the week and um, could preach all day long and then have not a whole lot of action behind it and that to me was always frustrating because I always felt like I always had action for my words and I was always true to my word and um anyway just getting to a place where I felt like I could come out took 21 years <laughs> and it really wasn't by choice coming out that's 21 years of a lot of bandwidth that we lose. Yeah. 21 years that uh, it takes away from who the real K is, right? Right. And I feel like I wasn't able to share my true self with a lot of people because I always had all my persona of who I was trying to um, be seen as, especially within Mormonism. I was a chameleon. Yeah. So. And, that, and I want to talk about that. I want to talk about, um, I want to spend a little bit of time on what Mormonism did to uh, assist in this closeted nature of your experience. Um, and I want, I want to talk a little bit about school too. Uh, so we kind of get an idea of your family structure, your siblings, and you describe them as Jack Mormons, which <laughs> makes me giggle a little bit because I get it. Like, <gasps> Um, it's a very similar family. Your parents, though, were they were they Orthodox? Were they Jack Mormons as well? What kind of was the the relationship at home, the structure at home in terms of religion? Well, my mom is a convert to the church, and my dad um, was adopted into a family that um, was Mormon. Um, my dad's from like Montana. My mom's from Washington, and they came to BYU to meet. That's where you kind of find your partner and got married really young. I think my mom was 19 and just started having kids really fast. My mom supported my dad to get through school. Um, and before she knew it, she was in five kids and my dad was um, part of the military and gone a lot um, between work and, um, but they all, we considered ourselves typical, active Mormons who would still go to church every Sunday. If my dad wasn't there, my mom would take us um, regardless. And um, we, it was definitely like a weird dynamic where it's like we were devout, but it wasn't consistent. And um, I think it's because 
I didn't know this till, you know, I have hindsight's 2020, but my dad was cheating on my mom when I was younger and he was gone a lot because of many excuses, I'm assuming, but he used military and work as a lot of his, you know, not being in the house. And so my mom raised us still to be devout and going to church every Sunday and tried to keep that structure of the family glued together and still tried to be traditional, even though she was fighting this battle that none of us really knew until everything surfaced, right? Um, and that to me was really sad. Now, looking back with that reflection of knowing what she had to suffer really by herself, didn't really feel like she had support from neighbors or anything like that because there's a lot of judgment um, around her, you know, getting eventually divorced. Um, and at some point she did mention, you know, well, it's because your dad wasn't faithful. And that's when our Mormonism kind of went through a wave, but we were always pretty devout and consistent with still going to church. But I think that caused a good ripple in our relationship with like Mormonism. How old were you when she divulged the great family secret? Um, I didn't know for a long time, really. I think I didn't fully understand. I was seven when everything took place, but ultimately I was probably like 11 or 12 when I had more like understanding of like, oh, that's not true. Hold on. When I got baptized, my grandpa had to baptize me and that bothered me a lot because I was just like, why is why am I not getting baptized by my dad? Like everyone else gets baptized by their dad. Like this is frustrating because it feels like I'm not fitting the mold. And that was a big thing for me. I just wanted to feel like I wasn't different because I already had my own, like, I just wanted everything to feel perfect. <laughs> Control issues, maybe OCD. <laughs> so. I wonder, and maybe this is just speculation on my part, but seeing that fi family dynamic, knowing that you're different, knowing that there's something about you that has an affinity towards other people who look like you mm -hmm. also, but then also seeing a disturbed family background, things that weren't lining up as they should, if that had any bearing or impact on what you thought a relationship should look like, what you thought a family should look like, did that influence your sexuality in terms of coming out at all, in terms of your um, commitment to or better or understanding of a marriage or what a relationship should look like? I'm sure. But like when I was going through the motions, I don't, I don't think I felt like I realized how much of an impact it was on me until you can look back at your picture or your story and go, Oh, I can see how that does play a role for sure. I definitely had anger and frustration in, um, how that betrayal kind of happened to my mom and just feeling like, you know, man, guys can be jerks. <laughs> but like, I don't think that's why all of a sudden I had like a bad taste in my mouth for men or anything like that. No, it was more, I um, just didn't feel that comfort or safety or love there and connection to you know, the opposite sex. So no, I think, and I, I think that's a great way of unpacking that because I, I, I mean, disclaimer, I don't think or believe that we can be influenced into, right. Um, or our sexuality changes based on our circumstances, uh, overbearing mother, distant father or reverse or right. any other factor that helps someone become gay. I don't believe that. I, I really just wonder if you looked at that dynamic and thought, I don't want that for sure. For sure. What is it that would bring me happiness? What is it that would bring me connection right. uh, as part of your story? But you do at some point start understanding that I am for sure different mm -hmm. and puberty hits. Mm -hmm. You're now also getting into middle school, high school. There have to be some raging hormones. <laughs> Things there that were. are starting to happen. There were hormones. That start um, setting you apart. So my friend that I already told you about when I was younger, she was um, 
very stunning. She's just beautiful. Everyone was pretty much attracted to her. Um, the girls wanted to be her. The guys all wanted her. And she <laughs> would make a game out of it at a, even a younger age, sixth grade for me. But like during the summer, how many boys can we kiss? Like, let's make a list. Let's definitely um, see who has the most by the summer's end. And so I think from a really young age, I was kissing a ton of boys, maybe out of competition, but not really having it mean anything. Um, and it was just out of fun and it didn't have to mean anything, right? And then when it came to junior high, it seemed like a lot of like girl sleepovers would turn into sometimes something a little bit more. And um, I did experiment a lot with just friends, but it never meant anything didn't ever evolve into anything for me but I always had feelings when I was you know um, if I kissed a girl or I had emotions for a girl that's when real shame and guilt would show up but I could do those exact same things with a guy feel absolutely nothing if anything just disgust you know so I just would feel like something there was on my awareness from a really early age of like, why when I kiss a guy, do I need to go like brush my teeth immediately? Cause I feel dirty. But when I kiss a girl, I liked it and I shouldn't. And um, now there's shame. <laughs> so shame, but at the same time, connection. Right, right. But not knowing that was real connection or like a spark of something that was sincere or real. Um, but now with that reflection, I can see that that was like a real energetic piece of like, oh, that meant something to me. That made me come alive because it was real. What, is this, so. what does this do for Mormonism? What does this do for what you learned at home, what you sat many hours on your knees praying for, praying against, or trying to better understand? How, how does the, all of this mesh? That creates a lot of anxiety. I'm an anxious person. Um, and for, like I've already mentioned, a perfectionist in a lot of ways or OCD where I feel like I have to be a certain way. And when you start realizing you are never going to fit that mold unless you make yourself really small, um, I started feeling really suffocated in a way of like, I'm going to die here to fit this mold. I'm going to lose myself here because I... I always hated those um, lessons in church where they're like, be yourself, like, let's build on who you are and, you know, loving yourself. And I was just like, if you really, if I really got to be who I am, who I know I am, no one would like me here. I don't fit here. Like, if I really express myself and show you my true colors, um, I have to leave in a way I'm not welcome here. And I could feel that because every lesson, it felt like always led to, how are we gonna get you to the temple? <laughs> like, well, I don't know if I'm gonna end up at the temple. I think that's honest. That's yeah. super fair. Yeah. That, and it's probably very relatable to a lot of people who um, are gauging their experience with your story. Um, and we uh, just we were just just discussing this kind of off camera, um, this level of authenticity that comes up when it's difficult to accept praise. It's difficult difficult to accept any type of adulation when someone on the outside who's offering that praise says, "Okay, you did such a great job. There was so many good things that um, you you do in your world." And it's difficult for the gay person to accept that as honor and praiseworthy because you say to yourself, if you really knew who I was, you would not be giving me that compliment. You're complimenting the fortress. You're mm -hmm. complimenting the walls that I've built in front of my face. And if you really want to give me that praise, I can't accept it because it's the outside. It's the robot feel real. that I created that that did all these wonderful things. 
that has to change. Mm -hmm. That that's the part of these stories that we get so many through the podcast that we have to fix that. Right. We've got to get to the point where we honor the lived experiences of everybody exactly where they're at today. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's so important. I mean, that's how we thrive, right? And no longer live for other people or organizations or institutions. I mean, that's literally like what I strive for every day to make it so my life is real to me and not fake and false and living for everyone else's happiness. Because through those years of it being so, um, I was a people pleaser. I mean, me feeling like I had to make everyone else comfortable, everyone else happy with my lifestyle. There was an internal anger, you know, like I just want to be happy for me. And eventually, when I did start living my life for me, that peace and like happiness that really floods in, that is sincere and real, makes it so like, oh my goodness, I can finally breathe and live my life for like what feels like the first time. And whether people like it or appreciate it, it is real and raw for me. So often when we get to these stories, we talk about uh, multiple coming outs. And we'll talk a lot about the coming in process, the um, giving ourselves the ability to open doors to other people to allow them to come into our lives. But um, was there a, was there a personal coming out for you where you got to the point where you said, um, if I am going to be exactly what you just talked about, authentic and honest and open and real and thrive, I have to look myself in the mirror and say, I'm a lesbian yeah. or I am dot, dot, dot. Did that happen? Or what was that experience like? Yes. When I finally had the verbiage for everything, um, it still was hard to say, of course. I think everything in its own time. But growing up with my family dynamic, knowing that they were more on the homophobic side, side, um, verbalizing lesbian out of my mouth just took so much time to feel comfortable with that. Um, And for whatever reason, I just felt like saying gay was easier. Um, And maybe it's because it's connected to happiness. (laughs) Like you can see that word two ways, but um, I, I definitely feel like once I accepted myself was in my later years, I was probably close to graduating high school when I realized like I want to live my life for me and love myself and that means that I need to like take ownership of who I am and start really living my life um in a true authentic way um but still struggled to tell other people right but then I started living the actions that I was feeling Um, And that started relationships, real relationships outside of high school for me. And Um, all super closeted. All super private for, till I turned 21. So like right out of high school, I was 18. And then till 21, everything was so super private. Where, this is fascinating. Um, Fascinating because it's relatable. But where does someone who's 18, 17, 18, 19, whose religious background is Mormon, living in the beehive, the great state of Utah, find other lesbians to date and yet (laughs) still remain closeted and try to keep this as sheltered as possible because the Mormon bubble is small. It was small. Um... I was sheltered, so I I didn't know (laughs) where to go meet anyone. Um, And just jumping into my story, um, I had met Chris while I was in high school. um, And we, there was no like relationship piece, but there was like an internal spark that I felt immediately when I met her at the time. And a part of myself came alive 
and something that I had suppressed for so long, all those pieces started surfacing um, just by this one individual being around me. Something that I thought I had worked through or wasn't going to have any issues with all of a sudden was like pouring out of me in the sense of like, I feel like I have a connection with this person, but I can't do anything about it. <clears throat> and I was still quite young. And um, eventually I graduated from high school and Chris and I crossed paths. Um, we had kind of had connection, but there was one point in particular that I had just made it known that I was interested. And so you're making it, making me want to answer your question. Like I have all the answers of where to meet someone, but I feel so bad that I'm like, I just found my person and I've been with my person ever since. <laughs> so it was easy. <laughs> Not easy, but definitely worth it. So we, we met when I was um, 17, almost 18 but didn't really start dating until I was probably like 18, fresh out of high school and really open to having a real relationship that I had never had up until that point. What was it like to finally have someone that you could talk openly and honestly about this subject with? Was there, did that happen or was there any redeeming factor to that? For sure. I felt seen. I felt like this is like the first person in my whole entire life that I can be like honest and transparent with and like bear my soul and be loved no matter what. And that was so freeing and like overwhelming. Like I just didn't know that existed, that you could actually find another person that you feel safe and love and completed and just all the holes that you were trying to fill constantly, just all of a sudden you feel whole just in that person's presence, you know? Um, so to answer your question, how did it feel? It was just like heaven on earth. <laughs> it was uh, fi fireworks. It was. It would de definitely when you find your person and like you love that person with all of your being, it is electrical. Your whole bar body is just charged those so i'm assuming that your family still doesn't know no because this coming out hasn't happened yet. no <laughs> does anyone look at you and say <clears throat> um okay there's something different go like what has happened what what's going on in your world for sure i mean i feel like that's when my mom started being like there's something going on. There's more here. Who are you spending your time with? Started like really trying to get into my space and be that like, I guess, I don't want to say helicopter mom, but definitely like there's more to this story. Um, and I just tried to really push her out as best I could because I didn't want to lose what I had. So I was protecting it <clears throat> by keeping it as private as possible. So Truly, I'm sure people noticed, but I tried to turn it off when I was around other people so nobody would ask questions um, so that I could keep it safe and private and not have to share that with the world. As devastating as that was, because when you find that happiness, you only want to share that love and have them see that joy and really understand that, like, it's real. Did you think, um, and we all, when we dated either when we f fake straight dated oh, yeah. <laughs> or um, just just dated in general, did you feel like you were disadvantaged? Like you didn't have the tools? Um, was there a lot of catch up that you had to do? Was there a lot of personal lessons or learning that you had to navigate in order to be dateable and in order to put yourself out there in a relationship? And how does Chris respond to that? Like me dating other people didn't really happen a lot. So I, going back to high school, um, I was a cheerleader. I was super involved in school and everything. And I would do your typical like time frames of meeting a guy and going to a dance with them. But as soon as I was done, it was done and I never let it evolve. Um, 
but like dating outside of high school or dating after graduation, obviously I found Chris and there's more to that story that comes later when I try and fit into more of a Mormon, um, pretty much I try and end my relationship with Chris and put that away and conform to the Mormon way um, after coming out, so. So that is our... To answer your question, I didn't date. <laughs> that's going to be our teaser. So we have this episode, Kay's episode, Chris's episode's coming up next, and then we have a couple's episode that we will definitely get into uh, the dirty, the nitty gritty, the <laughs> salacious. Well, that sounds really exciting. Oh, we have, we're we're going to do anything for viewers, so <laughs> we'll say salacious. We will say nitty gritty. You will want to hear it. We will say lesbian love. Ooh. <laughs> but you're changed. There's something about this relationship that's making you different. Um, yeah. For the better, and people are paying attention to it. Yeah, I definitely was super happy, and I felt super healthy and whole. Um, with my relationship with Chris, um, the hardest part was not being able to share it with other people and knowing that by opening up and letting others in, it could cause a kink in the relationship and make it, um, less tranquil or, you know, at the moment it, everything was bliss and I didn't want any problems. Um, but I knew it had to happen for our, our relationship to evolve if I ever wanted it to grow into something um, more. Um, so at the age of 21, I finally decided to come out, but I kind of had to because I had an email that I had written to Chris and my stepdad came across it and was like, it says, I love you, babe, and all this stuff. Like, is this just a friend? <laughs> and I said, um, I was pretty close. This is my stepdad. Um, my mom ended up getting remarried. Um, and we had this long conversation where I feel like I just opened up and said everything that I had been wanting to say and not really thinking about like what I was saying. It was just pouring out of me. Um, cause I felt like it was going to be a safe place. And he made me feel like he was, he's always loved me. So I never doubted that love, um, by opening up to him. Um, but he definitely at the end was, I'm sure like, I don't know what to do with this. That's what I was hoping didn't, it wasn't going to come out. Um, but also you need to tell your mom. And so then I felt cornered that this, you know, coming out had to happen on someone else's terms and not my own before I was quite ready. But I knew also if I finally just laid it all out there, I would feel more free to have that movement in my relationship too. So what did you fear the most? Did you fear coming out and, um, people being embarrassed about your story or, uh, were there other more traditional or non-traditional fears that you had with such a big revelation to your, to your mom, especially? I mean, of course, growing up with the Mormon culture, I, had so many good relationships. I had all my best friends who were um, very active and very devout. Um, my mom and her new marriage with my stepdad, they were devout, both worked at BYU and um, still do. And, you know, my dad had got, um, rebaptized into the church and he had got married to this amazing woman who um they had this very beautiful you know anyway what i'm trying to get to is i just felt like i had all these people in my life that i just didn't want to disappoint because of that people pleaser inside of me um and i was afraid to lose anyone um especially just not wanting to disappoint parents and feeling so close to my friends that I would be devastated to lose them in a way. Um, but eventually I loved Chris so much that like I was willing to leave it all behind. I literally was like, if I never talk to any of them again, I'll be okay. And I, I say that I probably wouldn't have been because I love them all so much, but like, 
that's where my headspace was that like my relationship was the most important thing to me um and being true to who i was and um not living a lie anymore was so important to me that i'm like if you guys love me this will be okay if you don't love me I'm, i have to move forward in my life so clearly you were blinded by firework light <laughs> exactly really like blinders to anything else that was about to come it was definitely those fireworks the gases from the fireworks had confused you yes that your love for chris was greater than the love for your family <laughs> that sounds terrible but like i was very very head over heels in love yes as it should be yeah as a relationship should be um but also it it goes to better understand this experience for those who aren't lgbtq who who are straight cisgendered looking from the outside in on this topic this really helps explain what it's like to have a desire for a relationship yeah this is what it's like i mean what was it like i always offer this question to this to the straight community at what point did you realize you were straight <laughs> no that we don't ask those questions when was the last time you asked somebody or told somebody you are too young to know you're straight? Yeah, that's ridiculous when we talk like that. Likewise, we get that same type of messaging when it comes out to, well, you were too young to know you were gay. You were too young to know that you were attracted to women. You were too young to get yourself into a relationship and get so flustered and fireworky and mm -hmm. head over hills. No, the reality is. Right. Connection is connection, right? Relationship is relationship and love is love. Mm -hmm. And that's really that meaning when we say love is love. This is what we mean. You can't make it up. You can't make it up. No, mm -hmm. this is this is an affinity. This is a natural attraction. And I'm glad you were able to have it. But yeah. that puts you in this predicament predicament. <laughs> yeah. Now I have to let other people into this world. Right. And that is really, really uncomfortable territory. Right. Because it's we don't know how to do it. Well, and especially since I had grown up being such a people pleaser, I mean, I literally had every calling you could imagine, like a beehive president, my maid president, Laurel president, had even been called to be a seminary like president. <laughs> like, I was really good at faking it, you know, and being perceived as good and righteous. And I wasn't doing anything that was not necessarily good or righteous. I just knew, like, if they knew who I was, I wouldn't have these callings, but apparently god loves me so <laughs> that's how i kind of felt like i must have something to give um to receive these callings but at the same time maybe um maybe if i just you know can be good enough and they love me enough when i do come out it won't matter because they're always going to know who I was and am because they've already seen it. So it shouldn't change their mind, but it does. <laughs> how did your mother react? How, how was the information received? Oh, so well, it was beautiful. No, um, I wish I could say that, but she, she took it really hard. She had a really hard time with, um, knowing how to handle what, to say i mean she definitely was why is this happening what did i do wrong um you won't have children so that was where i got really angered because i'm like i am going to have kids and i hope that you will love them and treat them the same as all your other grandkids because my family's really big um lots of grandkids so for her saying you know you won't have kids i was like well no, I'm, it's part of my plan. I will. I'll still find a way. Um, even at such a young age, I'm 21 at this point, right? But um, I felt like, and I don't want to put anything negative on her because I know she just didn't know how to handle the situation, but I just felt like it was more about how she was being perceived um, in the end of like, what will this look like for me? How will this be reflected on my reputation? I am, obviously she was very active in the church and very um, devout at this point and her job is BYU, right? So I think it was just a lot of like, this doesn't fit in 
with what is comfortable for me right now in my life. So I kind of felt. <laughs> and I think this is, um, I mean, just I'm looking from the outside in at this story. She survived a divorce that shook the celestial bond mm -hmm. in the family. She held the family together. She then remarried, put a lot of those pieces back together. And now her fifth child threatens to shake or break that celestial bond again. So I, I can see, and I think there are plenty of mothers, especially parents, I should say, of, of queer kids who recognize these experiences because they don't want to jeopardize that celestial nature of the family, which is so Mormon. Um, and here was someone who threatened the bond. And maybe this is offering your mom a little grace from my position because I see it so often that it's not about the necessarily about the needs of their child at that coming out experience, but it's about their fear of what could happen and right. what this actually means. Totally. And that's exactly what I, it <laughs> seemed like it was. And I could see that. So to me, I felt very angry because I'm like, this is no longer about um, your love for, or like our relationship. This is more about what you think everyone else is going to think. And um, I, I left our conversation probably angrier than I had been at that, up to that point. Um, ever in my life feeling like I'll never talk to her again. Because it was all about her and mm -hmm. not about your vulnerability? Is yeah, that and I had just poured my whole soul out there and felt like I'm being vulnerable and this is terrifying and scary for me to even put into words and you are immediately dismissing all of that and making me feel like it's more important about how we're all perceived around here and I... No, she wouldn't really feel like this is how or her intentions were, but that is exactly how I felt when I left our conversation where it all of a sudden felt like as much as my mom loves me and we have a good relationship now, it felt like in that moment, the love was very conditional upon fitting a mold. I like, I like, I mean, I don't like the whole situation, <laughs> but I like the way you unpack that because yeah. I think that's real. And uh, that's a great lesson to parents out there who are navigating this, even without knowing or having their kids come out specifically right. or formally, uh, knowing that that is a grand fear that each of us have in having this discussion with our families. And, and maybe for parents out there who likely will have these conversations with their children, uh, give your kids some grace as well. Offer and extend, because really this is them letting you in. This was you reaching out to your mom and saying, mom, here's a little bit more about me. I'm inviting you in and letting you get to know me better. And when parents turn that around and say, but that impacts me too much, we need to avoid that. Right. Right. Not only just within our own household and under <clears throat> our own umbrella, but culturally uh, as a church, as a society, right. We need to focus on the importance of the individual story and the individual experience. But, that still didn't diminish your relationship with Chris. Um, Not, was that what kept you bu buoyed up a little? Yes. Cause it also felt like, okay, well, at least that's one person off of, or two people that I've at least got it out to, um, out of and the you're many still saying dang email AOL. <laughs> like, why did I have a family computer that I had to share? <laughs> um, but I also at that point was like, how am I going to get out of my house? Because I was living at home um, and I was going to hair school and I was also cleaning houses to pay for my hair school. Um, and one of the ladies that I cleaned for um, was in our ward, our family ward. And she had come in to get her hair done at, you know, when I was going to hair school and she had a house that she was inviting me to come down to down in like um it's on your way to saint george i'm forgetting the exact place now but she's like invite some friends and you know come use this space and i'm like what friends because <laughs> i had cut all my friends kind of out of my life for my 
relationship to be safe and protected. And I said, well, I do have one person that I could probably bring, um, but I don't know if you would appreciate it, you know, cause we, at this point I was just making it sound like, you know, my friend's a bit <clears throat> older than me. Not that there was anything else there, but my friend and I have quite a few years between us, but you know, if the offer's on the table, sure, we'll go. And she just pried into a bajillion questions of like, well, tell me more about this friend. I've never heard about this friend. We've, you've been cleaning my house for all this time. Now I want to know a lot more. And I ended up, this was like a week after telling my mom and my stepdad kind of, and this just naturally unfolded where I'm like, well, I've already told them, I might as well tell everyone. So I just started telling her all the details of what um, my relationship was. And she immediately just stopped me and like started, you know, she was crying and she's like, you know, have you ever let God try and like heal you? Like, have you ever even tried to overcome this? And I just was shocked for, for the first time in my life. No one had really got through to me to even think about like, have I really let God try to heal me? Like I need to be fixed. Even though I knew that I kept that part hidden for so long, I never felt like super broken around it. I just felt like, I don't know the right way to explain that, but like, I didn't feel broken that I needed to be fixed. Um, so when she was like, God needs to, or you need to let God have a chance. And I don't think you fully have. I kind of was like, well, what do you even mean? What does that mean? I pray. I still go to church. I'm still paying my tithing. I'm still going to church, even though I had my relationship on the side, I was making it work for me. <laughs> um, but she was like, that obviously doesn't work where your um, ending goal needs to be kind of the temple and you're missing out on all of, she just brought into pers perspective everything I had been taught in Mormonism and like, your life is a slippery slope, she would say to me over and over again. Like, you, Satan has such a hold of you, and you're about to slip and fall, and your life is never going to be something wonderful. Like, it's going to be this false, this false happiness. Like, you are... So, I was shook and felt like, well, I guess, you know, if she sees this for me, then I need to at least try to give this a try, a shot to heal myself. Um, so that is when our relationship, mine and Chris have a really rocky next three years. And um, we pretty much break up and I devote my life to becoming the best Mormon that I can. <clears throat> and just, I had to obviously meet with my bishop and stake president and go through the whole uh, repentance process and really, you know, go through that whole deconstruction in a way of what will this mean moving forward? Um, I do. So. I, I want to talk about um, specifically about religious leaders, what your bishop and what your stake president offered as advice, um, what they thought were remedies. I do like the breaking analogy that you talked about. And as you were discussing that, I thought, what is a, like, what is a good analogy to best understand um, to say I'm not broken in need of being repaired, but yet there's some part of me that feels cracked. Yeah. And as you were talking about that, I was thinking of an egg of a bird being hatched. We have to break. We have to crack in order to fly. There's that part of us that has to break out of that shell, either self-created or created for us in order to use our wings. Right. And that was just a, an epiphany for me as you were talking about that. Like, yes, I've heard it over and over and over again. Um, 
there's something that needs to be fixed about you. That's beautiful. About our community. No, right. no. There's something that needs to break. So we it, can all be free In and order fly. for us to fly. I agree with that. So did your bishop, did your stake president have helpful advice, archaic, traditional advice, Mormon advice? What did mm -hmm. they tell you? I feel like it was really traditional. Um, it's almost like the parent being like, it's just a phase, right? These bishops just couldn't believe with me sitting in front of them that I was a lesbian or that I would, you know, not outgrow this. They just knew in their hearts that like, you, you're going to find a man, you're going to get married in the temple. Like we just can see that and feel that for you. Um, and we, you know, just need to clear up these few little things. Cause it seems like you're going to be just fine. Like they, it was almost like, I don't want to feel like I was dismissed, but it was almost like, we're going to get this figured out for you and you're going to be okay. And I believed them in a way of like, okay, yeah, if this is God's way and God's going to heal me. Then tell me what to do and I'll follow your direction and your guide and I'll sit here and I'll meet with you and I'll talk to you and I'll try to do all the scriptures that you are giving to me. They always would have, I'm trying to remember any specifics, but the way trauma works, right? I feel like I have blacked out a lot of that stuff because even though um, this should have been like a highlight turning page if you are typical, gonna head down a straight and narrow path for, path for Mormonism, for me, this is where it got really ugly and I fell really hard into like a really dark, the most unhappy I've ever been in my whole entire life. <clears throat> and I think part of having to eliminate Chris out of my life was part of that, you know, feeling like all those fireworks, all that love, all that connection got stripped out of my life. And then I have to find that after I heal here, you know what I mean? Like it just felt like it was never, ever going to be a real thing. But my Bishop, you know, even though I, had a good relationship with him and I felt he was very loving and kind towards me and my stake president as well. Um, I just felt like never really took me serious in the way that like you have same sex issues. We're going to get you to a point that you're going to meet a guy and you'll be on your way. This isn't, it's almost like a non-issue. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. Like, even though I'm like sitting here and I'm telling him, no, <laughs> I am attracted to women and I don't know how I'm just going to all of a sudden get over this. Um, they ended up getting me a counselor who also was in, you know, <clears throat> an LDS counselor. Um, this part was kind of a little bit weird where I met with her for about a year and she was like, I think you're cured. I think you're good. I think you're on your way to finding a guy. And in fact, I have a son coming home from his mission. He'll be home in about two weeks. I feel like you guys would be a great match and all this stuff. I'm like, what is even happening? Like, has anyone even heard me? I felt like no one was hearing me. Like, it was just, no one would take me serious. You're not gay. You're not a lesbian. You're going to marry my son who's coming home from his mission. Or just, it was almost taboo where I'm like, it's weird like none of this is making sense i'm not being taken serious so i think this is a great point because there is a reparative nature to uh the type of church counseling that you're discussing and traditionally i mean we're going to fast forward all the way to 2022 where we are in a society where conversion and reparative therapy have been outlawed that um, those types of change therapies we know are ineffective but that's still happening today in chapels across bishop or stake president desks everywhere, right. uh, almost exclusively, where there is this suggestion that if you just do a certain number of things, um, give yourself over to the gospel, study, pray, um, do all these things, you will change, or something about you will change. There are blessings, patriarchal blessings. There are right. all of these methods that Mormon leaders are still uh, influencing queer people to believe that they are, as we discussed, broken and in need of repair and, and need to be fixed. And they're not healthy and they're not effective and they aren't working. 
because they don't work. The reason why mm -hmm. the church had to abandon the idea of, of mixed orientation marriages as a remedy is because mixed orientation marriages doesn't work. They don't work. This is not healthy. Although I, I want to be respectful to the people who are stu tr still sure. trying because I'm sure that's hard when you love someone, but that chemistry or that piece is not there and you're still trying to make it work. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying um, mixed orientation marriages don't work in terms of the relationship not working. I'm oh, saying just... mixed orientation marriages don't work in terms of changing sexuality. Right. Um, saying that I am now straight because of my, my mixed orientation marriage. Right. It doesn't work that way. Right. And, and we just need to get away from this idea that a bishop or a stake president under whatever spirit they believe they're under, it, they are not going to convince, use speech therapy, use whatever types of therapy, talk therapy to convince somebody that, or change somebody's sexual orientation. Right. Just a hard truth. And we have to get to the point where we start honoring the lived experiences instead of diminishing or deleting those lived experiences. So you've come out to your bishop, come out to your stake president. Um, I call that a forced free agency situation, um, not necessarily by choice, but there is probably this maybe in the beginning a breath of fresh air, like a new, ter a new leaf, a new lease on life, an opportunity to turn um, something that wasn't into something that can become. But I think it's evident that you weren't able to replace the same feelings you had with Chris with the gospel or with this new K, right? with this new out K. Um, how do you work? How do you manage that? Well, that has to be depressing. It was, it was definitely the hardest part was when I was actually trying to date men along that road. Cause I'm like, I'm doing everything that I should. I'm putting great relationships potentially in front of me. These are great guys. Um, guys, I should definitely want to be with, um, I'm going to my singles ward. I'm meeting people. I'm out and I'm active. I'm doing, um, all the teachings I'm being devout. This is three years, right? Um, I meet a guy finally that the relationship really starts evolving quickly and it gets to a point where, um, you know, he's meeting my family and my family loves him and thinks he's really a great fit. And my mom had a conversation with him and he was pretty much talking about wanting to propose to me. And that's where I realized like, oh crap, like I've convinced somebody that I am okay with getting married or that this relationship can progress to that point where I cannot. Um, and that's after three years of trying so hard to change myself and to let God heal me and in a sense, pray in that gay away, I was like, it has not gone anywhere. And in the back of my mind, consistently, Chris is still just their potent, my one true love and no one can be that person, right? I mean, here's this great guy who sh who's marked all the boxes of every, you know, you know, what you're taught you're supposed to want. You know, he's gone on his mission. He's very active. He's um, devout. He's caring. He's kind, compassionate. He's all of these wonderful things. But every time that it turns to a more sexual nature, I cannot, you know, and that's where my body would just shut down. Like, and I'm like, I can't fake that part. That part is just like a total betrayal of self and I will not do it. And that's where I'm like, I can continue down this road and get married and bring someone into this and be miserable till death do us part or for the end of my life, eternity, um, if that's the route, or I can just actually live my life for myself. And at this point I realized like, I am not happy. I'm doing everything that I feel like should bring this everlasting joy um, that I feel like I'm told to do. And I've never been more miserable and unhappy in my life ever. I'm done. Cause I was so dark at that point that I'm like, anything's better than this, anything. <clears throat> And that's when I pretty much ran straight back to Chris and was like, I made a big mistake. 
<laughs> like, please take me back. So, so that's going to be, we're going to say that's episode three of this three part series. Cause I want, I want to, cause we'll bring Chris in and we'll discuss what this relationship then turns Involves. into. But before then, um, maybe some advice, advice to church leaders who are counseling young lesbians, young homos and homoettes who are navigating this journey. Um, from your perspective, what can church leaders do better? And then I want to ask the same question with parents, but in your, in your, from your perspective, when it comes to counseling, uh, queer kids or young adults or adults, uh, where is the church missing the mark and what can they do better in this space to make this transition uh, easier and more beneficial for the church and for the queer person? I think it's important to first if, and foremost, if anyone's coming out to you, whether you're a bishop or not, just loving them and listening and sitting with them um, and having that kindness and compassion human to human, just religion and everything aside, like hear them out and try to understand what it's like to be in their shoes. Um, put yourself in their exact same place and try and understand. Um, so there isn't that disconnect of like, I just don't understand. Well, try <laughs> to understand by getting educated. I feel like it's important to hear these stories, of course. Um, they're really helpful and beneficial, but at the same time, like take the time to educate yourself on what, you know, being, you know, LGBTQ on a spectrum anywhere in there looks like for all different types of people, because there isn't just boxes that we belong in. Like everything is so fluid. So just taking that time to understand that like we're humans. Um, so that's like to anyone, bishop, stake president. And I know that's hard because they're not going to do it, <laughs> but it feels like that's where my hope is, is that we can actually just have real conversations that, you know, obviously loving each other and um, listening is huge, but the understanding piece goes beyond just listening, but educating yourself. So I think you bring up a really great point about, um, that's the right thing to do, but Latter-day Saint leaders aren't doing it. And I, I think of the definition of, an ins of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, thinking that you're going to get a different result. And I just, my proposal to the religious community in or out of Mormonism is that, why don't you just give it a try? Try it. Try to be affirming. Try to put yourself in the shoes of a queer person. Um, Try giving them some latitude. Allow them the agency that you promised that they have. Uh, allow them the opportunity to flourish in personal revelation. And then allow yourself to be astonished and surprised at the result you're going to get. You're going to love them. You're going to love them. And you're going to see that they, they know their boundaries. They understand the, where the guardrails exist they also will thrive in the ability to be authentic. And when we talk about doing what is right and let the consequences follow from there, wouldn't you always encourage every one of your saints, every one of your congregants to do the right thing? Right. I just think that that is a rising tide that will lift all ships. Right. If we can all just be authentic and truthful with ourselves, no matter where you fall, there's going to be a lot more healing and people will be healthy and happy. And that's when the whole world becomes better, not just a religion. A little different question that I want to discuss with about parents. Uh, typically, I think you gave some great advice through the story with your mom uh, and that coming out experience and with your stepdad. But I want to reframe this a little bit um, more perspective precise about having discussions about queerness at home. We all could have benefited from better discussion about this topic around the kitchen table. How do we get, how do we reach into the world, parental world, uh, and let parents know that it's okay to say the word lesbian 
that it's okay to say the word gay, that it's okay to have these conversations around a kitchen table, that they're not taboo, that saying these words and discussing these topics, the Mormon word for this is proselytizing, that this doesn't, you won't become gay if you talk about gay things. You won't become a lesbian if you say the word lesbian, like it's Voldemort. How, how do we reach into that world and let parents know that it's okay to talk about these things? How do we let the parents know? Um, I feel like that is a hard question for me to answer because it's like the teachers that are teaching their kids, like how do you teach the teachers how to change? <laughs> um, and it has to usually come from even higher up. Usually in my mind, that's who they listen to. Um, so someone within a higher position, a bishop or some, something, changing their heart, the church changing their heart, their mind, and having more space would actually help a lot of parents. But that's probably far off. So just parents in general, how could they be more affirming and loving? There are other places outside of the church to look as resources. I mean, I, I've i benefited by being involved within Circle and feeling like there's a lot of different podcasts out there and there's a lot of um, educational resources that make it so if you're reading it, it doesn't become so taboo. Or if you're talking about it, it just becomes more common, you know, it doesn't feel like Voldemort or whatever. It just starts feeling like natural. And this is like any other word. A lesbian is easy to say, just like love is easy to say. It doesn't have to have a negative connotation because it is human. I like that. And sometimes we get into this and you, you bring up a very valid point that we cannot trust anybody that's not an authority uh, on a particular topic. But I want to counter that and ask you one question. Uh, how many years have you been gay? How many years have you been a lesbian? Uh, 35. I'm old. <laughs> I think I was born this way. So that is like three doctorate degrees I'm in an lesbianism. expert on it. You are an expert on it. Just need an expert lesbian hat. <laughs> Trademarked. Yes. Listen to the lived experiences of the LGBTQ community. That's what I say. That's the point of podcasts like this and others. Right. Um, we are the resources. The lived experiences of those who have navigated these waters are the resources for the parents and for the church leaders. Lean into those experiences. And and I think you can do wonders. And I think the kitchen cha the 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 view from the kitchen cha table changes when we're willing to recognize the needs of our people. And wouldn't the world look much different if we had as much concern for the global LGBT community as we do for the children that sit in those chairs around the table, around the kitchen table? And I know that's why people make a difference in this space. That's why I have an audience with this podcast. It's because they were directly impacted by this topic. Prior to having a queer kid, they didn't, most people didn't care about this topic. Right. But it's when it directly it impacts you, when it hits home, when someone that sits across the kitchen table from you, when you look at them and say, they are not the things religion told me about them. They are not a contagion. They're not a, di a disease. They are not a malady. They are not broken. When you can look at your child and say to yourself those things, something inside of you breaks. Right. And that's where I'm saying, lean into you are an expert and love conquers all amen so yeah. i got a tattoo even <laughs> i believe it so much if you can just have those conversations with love and see them as your own and everyone that you talk to just approaching conversations with love in your heart everything ends up better all right as we wrap version one of this three-part podcast series uh, what didn't we talk about pertaining to your story that you think the audience um, that you want to talk about that maybe the audience would benefit from? Um, I'm sure I forgot a lot, but... Ex 
experts don't forget. I didn't forget anything, right? <laughs> um, I think ultimately it's just like, I hope what comes across is just like, it's so important to just live authentically so you're not suppressing all of your emotions and just let people see you. And that's how we change the world. Be seen. Be seen. I like it. And love is love. And love is love. Okay, thank you. Thank you for thank sharing you. Um, the first part of your individual story. We're going to get into the juicy meat of the story um, in two episodes. Yeah, so we have Chris's episode coming up next and then the couple story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time and uh, occupying the hot seat for a little bit. Thanks again for having me. Hopefully, uh, I usually don't throw too many hard balls. Hopefully, it wasn't too difficult, right? No, no. It was, you make the place very comfortable. Perfect. That's what we like to hear. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, like I said, this is the uh, first of a three-part episode, and we invite you to follow along because this story unfolds, and it's super interesting and fascinating, and there's so much more to it that you have no idea. Uh, so we thank you for... Um, participating in this first part. If you are watching on the video version, we invite you to comment, uh, but more importantly, we want you to share uh, this episode. If you uh, resonated, felt, uh, saw something, heard something that meant something new to you, comment it. Let us know what that is. I'm super interested in uh, trying to better understand uh, what meant something to your own personal journey or what uh, new things you learned as well. You can comment that if you are watching on our video versions on YouTube, uh, in the live chat, or in Facebook below. Even if it's after this episode is premiered, we still follow along in the comments and, and respond and have those real-time conversations. If you are listening on the audio version, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. Uh, spoiler alert, those who do subscribe to our audio version through Apple, Google, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, or one of the other podcast players, always gets the episodes just a little bit earlier. So if you are part of the fan club who enjoys uh, getting the first cut of the episodes, we invite you to subscribe uh, to the audio versions as well. Often people will ask us how they can best help the Latter Gay Stories podcast. There are two simple, easy ways of doing that. Uh, one, we just talked about sharing the content and making it more visible on social media. And two, by helping us produce and promote, uh, produce and fund uh, episodes just like this by making a, don a donation to the podcast. Nobody's paid. Nobody takes a salary. We do this um, purely because we think the LGBTQ community is worth the investment. And it's... Uh, it's through our generous donors that provided this great studio, the equipment, and the many opportunities that we have to expand uh, the reach of the podcast. You can do that. You can make a monthly donation to the podcast by logging onto our website at LatterGayStories.org and clicking on the Donate tab. So it's pretty simple. We're also always Venmo friendly at Ladder Gay Stories. As we mentioned, this is a three-part uh, series. This is part one. We have part two coming up with Chris um, and his story. And then the couples, this is kind of like uh, the Real Housewives episode. So we're going to have the sit-down, end-of-season tell-all coming up as well. Again, we thank you for giving us an hour of your time for, uh, for connecting with and supporting the Latter Gay Stories podcast. It's stories like Kay's and your story that helps us each continue writing our own. Latter-gay story.